I want to start from reading a passage from a book. It's not my story, um, but I think it will set the tone for this talk. For a long time, the threat for me wasn't just from the state or identity thieves. More than anyone else, it was my partner. For three years, I was in an abusive relationship when my then boyfriend cyberstalked me. He used our shared network to get access to my browser history. He would use that information to pretend he knew me better than I knew myself and to exploit my fears. He used a keystroke program to get at my email password and therefore had access to all of my social media accounts. He made my email account passively forward every email I sent and received. He regularly looked at my phone too. None of my written communication was private. If I wanted a private conversation, I needed to call people or speak to them in person. But of course, my boyfriend curbed my social life by undermining my self-esteem and explicitly forbidding me to talk to some of my friends. He blocked my ex's friends from Facebook in a fit of jealousy, and it felt less embarrassing to let them believe that I had impulsively cut them out than to tell them the truth about my con controlling boyfriend. That was part of an essay written by um, a trans man called Morgan in the UK. Uh, Morgan is a sex worker, and he now works with uh, men who have been, who have suffered domestic violence. And I want you to keep Morgan's story, or at least that bit of it, in mind as we go through this, this deck, and I'm going to circle back to it towards the end. Uh, I talked to a bunch of people yesterday, and they all had various expectations about what this talk would cover. And I kind of want to tell you now to put those expectations aside. It's probably not going to be what you expect. Um, this is my story and how it intersects with other people. So my name is Sarah. I am an anonymity and privacy researcher. Way back when, I used to work for GCHQ in the UK. For those who don't know, GCHQ is the British government's equivalent of the NSA. I can't really tell you what I did there. Um, after that, I moved to Canada um, thanks to Amazon, where I was a software engineer and eventually a security engineer, um, where I worked in the retail space doing a bunch of security-related things, uh, up to kind of machine learning and um, detecting fraud in our anonymous, uh, autonomous systems. I left Amazon just under a year ago to found Masquerari Press. Masquerari Press is a, an organization dedicated to exploring and empowering marginalized communities. Uh, there are, we're going to go through a bunch of examples in this talk where Tools and technologies have failed people in extreme scenarios because tools tend to be written to support the majority, not the minority. And I want to build organizations and movements that empower people in sometimes desperate situations to take control of their lives and to build better ones. But to tell you that story, I need to tell you another story. And that is the story of Onion Scan. Just a show of hands, has anyone in this room heard of Onion Scan? A couple of people, cool. So, for those who don't know, uh, the Tor network is an anonymity network, which has a bunch of special properties, and I'm not going to go into how it works or why it works. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, you need to know that you can host servers on the Tor network that hide their IP addresses from the world. And this has a number of interesting um, results. First is that the servers, you can't tell who you're talking to, and the servers don't know who is talking to them. And hidden services are used by a variety of different people, many of which you've probably heard about, drug dealers, gun runners, uh, those who would sexually exploit children. Uh, but also political bloggers, journalists, whistleblowers, and a bunch of smaller communities, some pretty weird. I set out uh, February last year to understand how these anonymity systems interact with people in real life. 
Where do they fail? People using anonymity systems often have a reason for using anonymity systems. They have strong economic drives to stay secure, to stay safe, to stay private. And I wanted to know when they weren't going to do that. When were they failing? And I started cataloging the mistakes being made on these sites. And I did it in a tool called OnionScan as part of a larger project called the OnionScan Project, which, whose goal was to map the dark web. We map the dark web by looking for patterns and vulnerabilities in these hidden services. So we would find hidden services, which perhaps one hidden service was selling cannabis and another hidden service was selling amphetamines. But if you dug down into the, the code, you would find that they were using the same Bitcoin address to process transactions. This points to a relationship between those sites. Uh, less obviously, we would find groups of servers who were using the exact same software stack, not just you know, Apache PHP, but particular versions of those software which were rare in the real world. You know, these weren't default DigitalOcean installs. And lastly, we were able to find um, fingerprinting uh, vectors within these services. So we would find We would find other ports open on these devices that pointed to the same web server. Either it would have the same web server string or it would contain someone's name or the same IP address or whatever. And through this, we were able to make a map of the dark web. Uh, this is the latest map. It's from March 2017. And as you can see, there's a bunch of clusters everywhere. You probably can't see each individual connection. But you can see, for example, that there are a bunch of services that kind of just sit on their own and just only, but they're only linked to each other, whether it's through direct links, like I link to you, you link to me, or round robin links, you can see a few there, um, or things where we have found a central Bitcoin address that links these nodes, or we found vulnerabilities in the web servers themselves that um, de-anonymize these nodes so we can link them to a single actor. And this research is important for a number of reasons. First, it gives us an idea of where these tools are failing. These tools are not just used by drug dealers, they are used by whistleblowers. They're used by political bloggers. They're used by people just <laughs> trying to reduce the harm that happens when they take drugs because the health systems in their countries <laughs> don't support people who take illegal drugs. It also helps us because the dark web has a negative image in the media. There's a bunch of studies that will link that 50% you know, of the dark web is crime. And those studies <laughs> arrive at that figure by counting each hidden service. But that's a really bad way of categorizing hidden services. The two services I told you about earlier, one selling cannabis, one selling amphetamines, but they go to the same Bitcoin address. Are those two different organizations? Are those, is that two different crimes being committed? Or is that one organization that sells drugs? And those, that kind of counting has a big impact, both PR-wise and in understanding what people are actually using these things for in the real world. I talked about vulnerabilities, and I want to tell you quickly about a particular vulnerability in these web services. Um, those of you who have probably used Apache have most likely heard of mod status. It's a very helpful um, plugin for Apache. It's often enabled by default in a lot of configurations, and it gives you a bunch of information about the service, like its uptime, its uh, clients that are connected to it, what they're doing, the URLs, the server load which is great if you're running a, a regular website and you can only access mod status over localhost. Unfortunately, when you are hosting a hidden service, all of your connections look like they're coming from localhost. So what we find is that 10% of the dark web expose Apache mod status to the world. This means that not just server IP addresses, client IP addresses in some cases, and co-hosted servers, so multiple servers host on the same box, are visible. But we also see things in applications like API keys, passwords, and search terms. 
Uh, my favorite is I found a home energy monitor on the dark web. Um, it was well configured, like it had a password and stuff, but the server it was hosted on was Apache and it had a mod status vulnerability. And the particular software they were using exposed the API key in the URL. So you could just go to mod status, pick up the API key, and then make requests against the server to find out which lights were on in the house. And <laughs> it, it was pretty bad. Outside of home energy monitors, I found cryptocurrency wallets, uh, privacy-focused search engines, which exposed every single server uh, search query out to the world. Um, as well as uh, journalist websites. Um, so there are a bunch of uh, well-known media outlets that now expose some level of hidden service to the world. And some of those have had configuration issues in the past. Uh, through the Onion Scan project, we've been able to hunt those down and call them out and get them fixed, which is really cool. And the world is a little bit more private and secure because of that. And to kind of round out this, I wanted to talk about an example of complete de-anonymization. There is a drug dealer. They live in France. And they sell uh, amphetamines on the dark web. They have a very bare bones dark website. It's not flashy. There's no JavaScript. It's just a listing of products as well as a way to buy those products. Other things I can tell you about this person is their name. I can tell you that they own their own business. I can tell you they like developing iPhone applications. And I know their LinkedIn and their Twitter. I know this because they were hosting their business website on the same server they were hosting their drug website. And you can see at the top there, there's a, there's a very small screenshot of their Apache mod status output. It had their, their server's IP address alongside the domain name of their application servers. Some of the servers they were hosting for clients of their application development business. Um, and of course, their, their application development business website had a nice professionally taken profile shot and a link to a bunch of social media. As far as I can tell, Mr. Redacted is still doing business on the dark web and as a software engineer. Because I'm not a snitch. <laughs> <laughs> and so Onion Scan became a thing in the world. And it gathered a bunch of headlines. This is not up to date. There have been a few more since then. Um, and you can see where we released the tool and kind of the maps that we've been producing that and kind of the drug dealers who are making mistakes and the simple mistake that exposes the businessman's secret dark web drugstore. But I want to draw your attention to three of these headlines in particular. One is the dark web is disappearing by Gizmodo. And the other two at the bottom there, the, an anonymous group just took down a fifth of the dark web. And the dark web sites are hit in a cyber attack, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, these stories are based on an event that happened in February of this year. I was in Waterloo at the time. I was giving a talk to the university there. And it was a Friday. I'd done my talk on the Thursday and it was horrible and snowing. And I was in the hotel packing up. I was going to spend the day hanging out with my friend who is a PhD student there. At about 9 o'clock, I got a ping from Twitter. It was a security researcher in the UK. And he said, hey, looks like Freedom Hosting 2 has been hacked. Uh, Freedom Hosting 2 is a massive, or was, <laughs> spoiler, a massive dark web hosting site. Um, I had done previous research on it back in September 2016, and at that point we'd found out that it, it hosted between 15 and 20 percent of the dark web at any given time. Dark websites are very flaky, so numbers are equally pretty broad. And this would have been huge. Uh, he asked me to confirm with onion scan data, and I was able to quickly ping a bunch of these sites 
We were able to, we, we knew that they were hosted on Freedom Hosting 2 because Freedom Hosting 2 associated the same SSH public key um, with all, every web server that it hosted. So it was very easy, given a list of servers, to work out which ones were hosted on Freedom Hosting 2. Don't ask what happened to Freedom Hosting 1. And so my day went from being a very relaxing one to one where I was on the phone with journalists while my friend angrily sipped coffee as we jumped from Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi spot. And at the end of the day, a database was leaked containing 10,000 database dumps of the sites that were hosted on Freedom Hosting 2. Many of these sites weren't online. Um, Freedom Hosting 2 was notorious for just getting short spam sites that didn't live very long. But we did find that the top three largest sites were related to child sexual exploitation. They were web forums where people were discussing and sharing links to these kinds of content. Even though Freedom Hosting 2 explicitly forbids such content on its platform. That is the reason the hackers gave when they hacked Freedom Hosting 2, the reason why they completely destroyed it rather than just reporting it. It was a, a moral hack. But calling the crossfire after those top three sites were thousands of smaller blobs. Yes, yeah, some scam sites, some drug sites. But a lot of smaller blogs, a lot of smaller forums, a lot of forums dedicated to harm reduction, a lot of forums dedicated to privacy and cryptography, just people exploring their privacy and anonymity in a fairly safe space. And a lot of that information was leaked. It's now public. You can probably find the dump somewhere. And you're probably wondering at this point what any of this has to do with consensual tech. And the story I read here at the start. The truth is that there are lots of use cases and lots of scenarios where tech fails. Everyone on an anonymity network has a reason for being there. And we've seen how disastrously that can fail and how badly the tech supports cases, even when people are trying really, really hard and in many cases have tech skills. What happens to the people who don't have tech skills? What happens to the people who are at the mercy of the state, at the mercy of their partners, at the mercy of their family. And so I've been talking to a bunch of people recently and working with some groups on these areas, things like online dating. You might think that online dating is a fairly simple thing, but for queer people, especially gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans people, um, online dating can be a nightmare. Um, especially in this age of social networking and Tinder, if you want to go out and date somebody who perhaps your family wouldn't like you dating, or perhaps you've not come out yet and you don't want people to know, you want to explore, it's very hard to do that nowadays because your Tinder profile is linked to your social network and you start getting cross links and people might see you. you know, people just browsing might notice you, remember you. Blog publishing is another area, and we've talked a little bit about anonymous publishing, but if you are a, an activist or a journalist in a regime that doesn't respect press freedom, like the United States or Canada, I half kid. But no, there are, there are now court cases in Canada where journalists have been are being put on trial in an attempt to get them to reveal their sources. The age of anonymous publishing, getting information out without being associated to an identity, whether it's the journalist's identity or the source's identity, are really important. As the world becomes more connected, it becomes harder to break those kinds of stories without completely destroying your life. And we're actually seeing that this week again Finding a safe house, we talked about Morgan at the very start of this talk. There are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of domestic violence survivors and sufferers 
across the world. They all have to find ways out of their situation. And that can be really difficult if your abuser is technologically savvy. If they are monitoring, like in Morgan's case, your web browsing, your email, your phone calls, who you're talking to, how in that scenario can you find somewhere safe to go? How can you start claiming your privacy in a world where you, you can't even talk to people without being monitored? And finally, I want to talk about exploring identities and sex. Regardless of who you are, there are going to be times in your life when you want to make a change. There are going to be times in your life when you want to break out of the pattern where you are, where you want to explore, regardless of what that is. And it's becoming harder in the world to do that. Social media, applications, meeting people, even just trying to sign up for a social group or, a, or be part of an organization generally leaves a digital footprint that can be traced back. Someone can find out who you were, who you're trying to be, what your goals are. And that can be really difficult. That can be a really difficult obstacle to overcome. And a common theme across those stories which I've contributed to you know, where domestic violence and cybersecurity intersect. The law isn't ready for the internet of sexual assault and, you know, how to keep your internet browser history private. A common theme that I give, the, the advice that I give to people, I hate giving it because I'm always telling people not to do things. You know, don't browse to weird websites. Don't use a computer that you don't trust. You know, don't visit, don't click on weird emails. <laughs> Occasionally, I can give people positive advice. I can tell them to install a plugin, or I can tell them to you know, go use a library computer if they want somewhere safe to start building a digital identity again. But for the most part, I am telling people to stop doing things. And that's really depressing. <laughs> And so, through Massberry Press, I decided to start thinking about what a world would look like where I didn't have to keep telling people no, where we could work out ways to empower people. And the first project that we produced is called Queer Privacy. It's a book. And that book contains stories. It contains Morgan's story. It contains a bunch of other stories from queer people across the planet. And I'm going to uh, read some snippets from some of those stories to try and convey to you the seriousness of these situations, to try and help crystallize this idea that technology should serve us, we should not serve it. We should not... We should be building technology so that from the ground up, it does not reveal information about you that you do not want it to reveal about you. Browsers should not by default track people. Ads should be powerless. Online dating shouldn't be a game of trying to hide from your friends as you try to find a partner. You should have full control over your life, and that extends to the digital life. Your technology should be consensual. It should never do something that you don't want it to do. And so I'm going to read you a little bit about Kath. Um, Kath is a bisexual woman in the UK. She is a full-time carer for her mother. Her family are very religious and they do not approve of her sexuality, of her partners.
Despite my inner turmoil and fear of the real me, I have dabbled in same-sex activity. Hailing from Greater Manchester, England, the famed LGBT district of Canal Street is almost on my doorstep. During my younger club-going days, Canal Street offered some relatively inexpensive establishments, perfect for the poor student. The mix of intoxicants and carefree attitudes of my fellow patrons led me to letting my hair down and relaxing. Over the years, I have woken up next to a few different women, but the seeds of my personal liberation were sown online. The internet became a lifeline for me and remains so to this day. In addition to my bisexuality, I'm also something of a BDSM enthusiast. My sexual preferences are far from vanilla. Chat rooms, websites, and yes, pornography all contributed to the, helping me cope with my inclinations and preferences. Kat's essay goes on to express her fears about the current political situation in the UK. The Conservative Party are pushing hard on internet censorship, particularly censorship around internet pornography, as well as calls for building databases for those who would visit uh, controversial sites, starting with sites regarding extreme pornography and terrorism, but once those situations and databases are in place, who knows where they expand to. Kath has already been subject to information leakage. She was a member of uh, a website that got hacked and someone tried to blackmail her. She ignored them and they went away, but she's terrified of her data leaching from her online life to her real life. Since we cannot trust the government to behave responsibly, nor can we trust them with our information. The only thing we can do is change our behavior. This is the antithesis of freedom. Nobody should feel that they cannot do something completely legal because the wrong person could gain access to their data. If it is dangerous for you to out yourself as LGBT, then the sad truth is that the only way to be safe in Theresa May's surveillance state is to refrain from visiting any site that could hint at your true self, whether it be porn or support forums. She goes on to say that the freedom that she experienced to become comfortable with being her doesn't exist today. That makes me really angry. <laughs> it makes me angry because technology should be about empowerment. It should not be about fear. And I want to go back to Morgan's story. Which has somewhat of a happy ending. As a sex worker, I'm now careful to vet my potential clients, to protect myself, and less importantly, to protect them. But most of the violence that sex workers face is at the hands of the police and the state, not from their clients. The work I do isn't illegal, but it provokes scrutiny. I also make an effort to keep my sex work identity very separate from my personal public identity by having separate devices and accounts and photographs for each. I've changed my habits on social media and now only post about places I've already been rather than places I'm going to, at least the day after. Trans people are constantly denied access to healthcare in the UK. There are lots of online support groups which have varying levels of privacy and anonymity. And the most discussed topics are how to navigate the healthcare system and to get access to hormones and other gender affirming treatment. I use Signal, an end to end encrypted secure messaging app, to discuss hormones with trans people who are struggling to get them. If I'm careful, I'm able to get testosterone for my friends who need it, but can't get it on the NHS because it's too slow, too dismissive and the costs of private care are too high. I now use two-step verification wherever I can, and a password manager with unique and high entropy passphrases. I have a strong passphrase on my hard drive. 
Reclaiming my privacy has been important both as an activist, as an immigrant, and on a personal level to help me regain control over my life. It's been empowering to realize that the tools and methods which my ex used against me can be frustrated and blocked with tools of my own. And I really love that last phrase. That tools and techniques used by abusers can be frustrated by tools that we build ourselves. Tools that people like you in this room can build. Tools that need to be built if we are ever going to create a world that's more equitable, more fair, more free, more democratic, more liberating. And so yeah, to that end, the main reason I'm here, the main reason I decided to do this talk, the main reason that I do anything these days is that I need people's help. I can't build all these tools myself. I'm a programmer, but there are simply too many use cases, too many scenarios, too many people to make that a possibility. We need ways for non-technical people to publish things anonymously. We need ways for people to discover that content. We need ways to utilize tools like the dark web so that non-technical people can do stuff safely. I firmly believe that anonymizing technologies like Tor are essential to building a platform of consent across our technologies. Because if you start with technology that reduces the information that you have available, that's the best way to start building consent because every step, every bit of information you convey across the wire has to be deliberate. We need ways to host these things. I've talked about Freedom Hosting 2. Freedom Hosting 2 was so popular because hosting websites is difficult. Hosting anonymous websites is even more difficult. And there are a variety of things that can go wrong from Apache mod status bugs all the way up to things like stylometry. There are a bunch of papers that look through dark web forums and try to connect people's identities together even when they're using different pseudonyms. We need tools that frustrate that. People should be allowed to discuss harm reduction strategies online without worrying that people are going to put their identities together and come you know, and hearing a knock on their door. And we need ways to solve all the technology, all the issues that I talked about before. Online dating, safe house discovery. How do we build tools that by default don't expose a person's identity? How do we frustrate real name policies that are often used to they're often brought in to stop harassment, but they end up creating more harassment, more worry, more harm. And yeah, how do we get a person who's in an abusive relationship out of it? What can we put in place, whether that's on a technological level or on a societal level? Things like private browsing mode, as useless as it is for most people, are really helpful in those cases because it means you can browse a site and know that it's not going to show up when your abuser checks the computer later on. Um, there is a great domestic violence um, help guide uh, by um, an organization called Hack Blossom, uh, which features a quick exit button. So it, when you are reading that website looking for security tips on how to take back your digital life, you can click the button and it goes to cute, I think it's cute corgi pictures. It sounds silly, but it works, right? It works. And whether it's low-tech scenarios like that or high-tech security controls on mobile phones or private anonymous web browsing and hosting, 
we need those tools. And so in summary, if there's ever a summary of a talk like this, it's that anonymity is hard and privacy is hard and everything is hard. <laughs> We need to listen to marginalized communities. The reason I put together queer privacy was to start amplifying the voices of the people affected by it. Queer privacy has stories from people who are sex workers, domestic violence victims, activists, just people living in Manchester trying to get by. And without their stories, without the stories of people like them, we can never start building that free world that I talked about. So I want to thank you for listening. Um, you can find me ranting on Twitter if you like this and want to contribute more to the conversation. And the writing that I talked about is available at mascarari.press. And I'd like to thank you again, and I'm happy to take questions. So you talked about the takedown of the Freedom Hosting too. Is, did a replacement? Is there a replacement in place? Is there someone? There is no replacement for Freedom Hosting too right now. The, the dark web is much smaller. Um, the last Onion Scan scan we did, um, people reported it as like an 85% reduction, which is not true. But um, there are definitely fewer options for people to host that kind of content now. Hey, Sarah, you mentioned the guy in France and that he's still out there. Is it that law enforcement is just not interested or they don't have the, the manpower to take down sites like that? So law enforcement across the dark web, across crimes in the dark web, are mainly focused on shipment routes. So the majority of takedowns on the dark web are from uh, customs officers intercepting um, packages when they're being shipped and then they trace those back to the buyers and the sellers. Um, it's very rare that you find um, law enforcement going after the sites directly, looking for the kinds of things I'm talking about, because it only really gets you that far. You need to put a lot more effort in for each site to fully uncover what's going on. Um, and there's a bunch of cross-jurisdictional issues too. You can start investigating someone and find out they're in a completely different jurisdiction to you, in which case all that progress has been lost, all that investment has been lost. Um, saying that, it's becoming more common. We're seeing um, job, um, job listings for, for investigators doing that kind of work that I talked about, sort of looking at the links between sites, finding, mapping out these, um, these relationships and going after it from a technological direction. Thank you so much for this talk. It's so, so necessary that we hear it. One of our clients, I work in IT consulting, we have clients that work for the federal government in DC, uh, and they do an open source intelligence. And one of the things that they have been hearing from some of their contacts is that the uh, Tor as a protocol, because of reductions like this, is becoming less and less possible. Um, and we've certainly seen reductions in the available Tor nodes for them to use for their own research. Um, what's next? What's, what, what, what's after? Mm. Um, that's a good question. I honestly think the answer to that is Tor. <laughs> um, there are a bunch of next generation anonymity networks that are kind of on the horizon, and they've been on the horizon for the best part of a decade. Um, there's, 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 there's ones that work in practice right now, such as I2P, um, that have some level of activity on them. Um, and there's uh, academic ones uh, like, uh, I'm gonna get the word wrong, it's Ripple, Riffle, <laughs> um, and a bunch of others that kind of, but none of them are general purpose networks like Tor. Tor allows you to browse the entire internet from 
uh, in an anonymous fashion, whereas most new anonymity networks tend to focus on the peer use cases and specific things like file sharing or something like that. Um, I, I do think eventually we will see mixed nets that are used for general purpose routing and perhaps, perhaps they will replace Tor, but given Tor's footing, given how many users it has, given how strong that brand is in certain places, I think with the next generation hidden services that are on the horizon and other technological improvements, I think we'll start seeing more stuff around Tor. Thanks, Jamie. Great talk. I really enjoyed this. Um, I work for a security company, and we've had like internal talks about how we could, what we could do, just purely as a, as a, you know, uh, something outreach to the community to offer uh, security keys, stronger ways to, you know, authenticate yourself, like you know, U2F, all that, which has a really low exception rate still, and we always kind of like block on like, how can you do that? explain it in a way that people will just be like, okay, I get this, I, I'll start using this. Do you know of any projects that are maybe more successful at this or what can we do to make that more of like a thing that people get and understand that you know, this is to their benefit? I don't know about projects, but um, there is some interesting research that has kind of originated the last few years that kind of focus on how you get these tools into the right people's hands. And the, the, the TLDR on those things is that people don't listen to security um, guarantees from software. They don't understand it, and if they do understand it, they don't trust it. Um, people instead make decisions based on how, that, um, how well that application looks like it serves their use case. So, um, you know, if they're interested in online dating or they're interested in um, casual hookup sex or just instant messaging, any of that kind of stuff, the applications need to be targeted at that niche. They need to be, um, they need to look pretty, they need to, and they need to serve that particular purpose. Otherwise, they won't be used. They, they'll be seen as being the specialist tool that only experts use. And so... <laughs> We might have to, and I've talked about this a little bit before, we might have to build technologies that allow us to build extensible shines on top of them. So have, take something like Signal, uh, take something like Tor, but dress it up for a particular use case. Allow that UI to make particular decisions relevant to that use case. So if, it is a, um, if it's a sexting app, you know, have Signal underneath, but you know, allow the technology to detect when you're sharing, you're sharing a photo of yourself and allow you to blur stuff out or strip metadata from the photo or whatever. Um, just having those extra features that don't make sense across the board but do make sense in those particular technologies or scenarios. Very, very compelling topic. Um, it's at odds with uh, another issue in front of us these days, and that is, the, you know, validating the sources of news. Um, do we have smart people working on this? How can we get involved? Uh, can you repeat that? I couldn't hear it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So it's, it's a compelling topic. We, it, it's at odds with another issue that's in the news these days, and that is the validation of okay. news. Yeah. Um, are there smart people working on this, and how can we get involved? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I don't know necessarily whether I would agree that these things are at odds with each other. Why, yes, there is a lot of fake news about, but humans judge news the way they've always judged news. The only thing that's becoming, the only thing that's changed is that people like, People, it is easier to publish new things now. That's the only thing that's changed is the ease of publishing, not the validity of the news. The news is always told from a particular person or particular group's perspective. As for what we can do to combat this, um, I think there are some interesting, there are some interesting smaller groups that are kind of working on ways, plugins and stuff like that to kind of validate and cross-validate news reportings. Um, <laughs> What I don't trust is movements like Facebook who are trying to point blank decide 
<laughs> which news is fake and which news is not. I think that creates more troubles than, um, than it helps. Um, but yeah, I think that the short answer to your question is, um, I think that that's a really, really hard problem. <laughs> Telling what the truth is is really hard. And I think that the best tool we have for that is more information, not less. Questions? Question? I have to pass a test to ask a question. Um, what do you feel about uh, Tumblr as a platform? I know that it prides itself on something of anonymity, and it has a lot of adoption, especially among younger people who will have problems fitting in or finding ways to express themselves. Yeah, I think tools like Tumblr and you know before it Live Journal and a bunch of other sites, they have a, a great place to play. And that is that they allow people to easily host content. The problem comes when that isn't enough. Like that there are a bunch of there are some stories in queer privacy that revolve around Tumblr posts. And if you are not under threat from a state, if you're not under threat from law enforcement, um, something like Tumblr is very useful if your adversaries are just people you know in your life who can't get court orders and who you know, don't have access to backbone pipes. So they, they play a role, but I think we also need better decentralized technology. Because without that decentralized publishing framework, without that way of evading even the strongest um, threat models, we can't protect everyone. <laughs> and we can't protect everyone in every jurisdiction. And so which is why I tend to spend most of my time focusing on the digital uh, decentralized endpoints rather than the Tumblr endpoints, which are very useful for certain cases, not others. Thanks, Sarah. That's a great talk. Um, so it seems that privacy and security are actually at odds with each other here. So I'm wondering what we can do as a society to recognize the, the validity and the need of having kind of uh, mass recognition of these tools. I mean, we've, we've talked about it with the New York Times uh, with regards to journalist submissions and the anonymity around that. So are there any higher profile projects that are somewhat validating the need for these tools in the public mind? Yeah, I think the main one is probably SecureDrop. Um, SecureDrop, for those who don't know, it's a whistleblowing platform that's hosted as a Tor hidden service. The New York Times run an instance, the Washington Post run an instance, it, it, many organizations across the world run an instance. And they allow sources to, using the Tor browser, go to a particular hidden service which they advertise, and then upload documents and communicate with journalists. And the journalists, depending on how careful the source is with validating the documents, will not know um, the identity of the source. Um, but they can use the, the documents and other relationships to validate them. So it's both a source protection framework and a way of safely delivering documents to journalists. Tools like that, I think, and going back to something you said right at the start, I do not think that privacy and security are odds. I think that people want you to think that privacy and security are at odds with each other. There is no privacy without security. And for many people, there is no security without privacy. We live in, the world has never been safer. But the world has never been safer not because we have people watching us 24 seven. The world's never been safer because science and technology have grown. We've been able to put safety measures in place in traffic accidents and improve our health. You know, things like terrorism and other bad people are really small scenarios in the larger context of society. Giving up on any level of personal privacy in order to further some feeling of security, it doesn't help people and it doesn't help the most vulnerable people. Um, 
do you do you have any advice or um, insight into the idea of merely possessing these anonymizing tools is incriminating? And I ask that in the in the interest of how can we normalize the use of these better? Um, for the most part, um, in most jurisdictions, the, the, the the ownership of these tools isn't seen as being an issue. It's only really seen as being an issue when you become under investigation. <laughs> um, the presence of these tools you know, leading up to a critical time can be an indicator. Like if, for, if, if all your activist group have done is talk on Facebook, and then suddenly you switch to Signal and you're just getting chatter of a protest, that can be, very, that can be a strong signal without the, the need to know what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to your point, yeah, normalization of these tools is really important. Um, normalization of signal, whether it's through just regular texting, it's why I, I talk about having shears on top of these tools to kind of go, hey, this is a sexting app, a dating app, but it uses signal underneath. Like, uh, using those kinds of use cases that are very popular, a lot of people use them, even things such as SecureDrop, having legitimate journalist organizations using hidden services legitimizes the use of hidden services. Um, and yeah, I'd like to see more of that, and hopefully we will see more of that. So my question here is going to be offensive to some people in the audience, but many people here work for companies that make a lot of money from data mining. How do we de-incentivize de the employees working for these companies to capture and store so much data? Is there a way to say, you know, it's easy to always say it's happening to someone else. I'm not the victim. I'll never be like that. I don't participate in blah, blah, blah. So it doesn't apply to me. I can collect as much data I want. I can store it, throw three or four anal you know, analytic systems in there. It's OK. I have nothing to hide. How do you switch that mind frame when talking to individuals to say, you are actually helping create the problem? That is a really good question. <laughs> and it kind of stings at the heart of momentum in this space. Personally, I like to I like to appeal to people's sense of self-integrity and self-defense in a way. Collecting data, allowing companies to collect your data. If you're a company collecting data, those are all liabilities. As a company, you really, really do not want to be sitting on a treasure trove of data when you get hacked, and you will get hacked. <laughs> um, that is just the way of the world. As a person, you do not want a random company to have your data when you get hacked, because it's really annoying to have to reset all of your cards or move, in some cases, um, with your social security number or your um, date of birth, address, whatever, out online. Normalizing this idea of data consent, of companies need to ask, and you need to you need to explicitly give um, is really important. Um, I would really like to see companies moving in that direction, explicitly asking for data. Um, I'm not that hopeful that that will be the case. I do not expect Facebook to put up a little prompt that says, hey, do you mind if we collect all this data about you? But I hope that with the normalization of these technologies, um, I'm looking at working with a bunch of people in various spaces to try and improve the technologies we have. Um, that we can start normalizing it in some use cases, and those will spill over. And it becomes the norm to ask instead of the norm to take. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>